you're a music artist and a singer as well. We're going to pivot. Yeah. How did you first get into <laughs> exactly? <laughs> um, that's a fancy little robot you got going. Uh, how did you first get into music and yeah, what was the main catalyst for mm. for you launching into that? Were your parents musical or did, where did you pick this up at? Because you have you have a great voice for people. Thank don't you, know. thank you. Yeah. Well, my mom is musical. Mm -hmm. She plays the piano. She was a saxophone player. Yeah. And she was in the Memphis State Marching Band, uh -huh. uh, Mighty Sound of the South. Mm. And she was first chair as a freshman. Wow. Yeah. So she was a really, really hip, really good um, sax player. Mm. So I imagine myself just like, you know, in there, my little egg being like, <laughs> I feel the soul music. <laughs> I feel the 70s funk right, right. coursing through my little body veins or whatever, you know. So my yeah. my mom was a, a sax player and very creative woman, total mm -hmm. renaissance woman. She, mm -hmm. She's amazing with design and um, embroidery and needlepoint and wow. um she can sew and make clothes. And so she definitely is an artist. Mm -hmm. And um, so she she's kind of like musical in that way. And my dad is, yeah. you know, he's got some moves on the dance floor. Okay. So. um can cut a rug or two. Yeah, he can cut some rugs. Yeah. Moroccan. Right. Um, Turkish. Yeah. He can cut those rugs for yeah. sure. Okay. And. um my my aunt, my dad's sister, was an actress, mm. and she was very creative as well. Okay. And um, my dad's mom, she was a crazy go getter, mm -hmm. and she worked in Hollywood in her twenties. Yeah. And she was an, a script editor. Yeah. And she would be like, "Uh, this is terrible. I'm just gonna." week a few lines here yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> she was like a very uh, bold woman mm. and so i have it kind of running through the family my mm. my it's funny because my mom's dad was in fashion wow and he was he worked at a suit store and he was like very into fashion and mm. he was an athlete wow um, he was in the Illinois Basketball Hall of Fame and mm. the Illinois Golf Hall of Fame. Okay. And so there's all these amazing pictures of him golfing with all these big golf stars right, right. through the 60s and 70s. And he had this afro, like this blonde afro, yeah. he was wearing these amazing suits. And he's like Bob Ross. <laughs> well, he's something. <laughs> I don't even know what he's like. He's a one of a kind, but right. he had like a hundred pair of shoes wow. and all these amazing suits. And mm -hmm. so it's like, and they lived, my, my grandparents on my mom's side lived in this gorgeous house that mm -hmm. was like a castle from the 1800s. Wow. And it was, they had taken it from Germany and rebuilt it in the 1860s in Crazy. You know, right off the Mississippi river. Wow. And so going to that house as a kid, I was in that gorgeous architecture mm. and like seeing the beautiful inlaid floors mm. and their crazy style, which was like shag carpeting. And <laughs> it was like a 70s. funky castle. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> The castle of fun. <laughs> so that's where I, you know, grew up and my imagination was just mm. level 10. Yeah. But with music, I I started at a young age. Yeah. So um, singing in school. Mm -hmm. My dad was very protective of me because that was like Jean Benet Ramsey mm. was in those days. Okay. And she was the little beauty queen that got killed. Wow. And so my dad was like, she's not going to do any beauty contests. Mm. She's not going to go do that. Like she's not doing it. Mm. And so it wasn't until my stepdad really encouraged my mom to put me in theater mm. that I kind of got more serious about it. And we did little music theater shows and it was a company called kid skits. And I started there when I was like 12 years old and 
I did, I think, eight original shows with them, and we got to go perform for schools all over the Denver metro area and got my name in the paper. Wow. You know, and it was like I was able to start doing it at a at a pretty serious level when I was a young teenager. So mm. that was my real like kind of professional, like first professional gig was being in that theater company. And yeah. and it was a lot more professional because um you didn't have to pay to be in it. Yeah. So if you could just afford a fifteen dollar t shirt mm-hmm. and the the little uniform that we wore, yeah, you could be in it. So we had a very diverse cast, mm-hmm. people from all different kind of neighborhoods and walks of life. And and the talent level was huge because mm-hmm. it was like open to anyone. Yeah. You had to audition to get in and then it was free to be in the performing company. So wow. it was such an amazing experience. And still to this day, I mean, even being a graduate of NYU music theater, it was just as good a training, if not better than wow. anything I had in school. Yeah. And cause we had to go make teenagers laugh Yeah, with right. songs that they'd never heard before. Right. And the, those audiences are tough. This tough crowd. <laughs> this a tough this crowd. Tough crowd, <laughs> I tell you. Yeah. So, um, that was when I got serious about that and then mm. was doing like, serious choir like all state choir and mm. all state jazz choir and being a soloist there and yeah um and then i went to nyu and then i was in funk bands okay i was gonna that. ask you where, where your kind of soulful style because mm-hmm. when i met you you were you had this kind of more soulful kind of vibe going on and yeah I was like, where did that come from well when i was at nyu i Okay, well, first when I was in high school, mm-hmm. I was in like jazz camp yeah. and I became a jazz camp counselor. Yeah. And so I was really into jazz and I was getting all these albums. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, all the all the greats, all the classics. Mm-hmm. Charlie Parker, John Coltrane, mm-hmm. Ella Fitzgerald, Sarah Vaughn. That's that jazzy. Yeah. 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 So I was I started with the jazz and then um this was way back in the day. VH1 did this series, the hundred greatest albums of rock and roll. Mm. And I just took that list and printed it out. And I bought every single record on the list. And I listened to every single record. And it, it gave me this depth of appreciation for the greatest music of all time. Yeah. And it's like, that was what set my standard. And it wasn't like, it was like my first album I ever bought was the Mickey Mouse Club, mm-hmm. which was not good quality music. <laughs> <laughs> it was, well, you were a kid. It was right? average quality music, yeah. I'll just say. But then it was like, then it goes to jazz, and mm-hmm. then it goes to all this amazing classic rock. And mm-hmm. it's like Stevie Wonder, The Beatles, mm-hmm. Rolling Stones, David Bowie. And and one of the albums on that list was Parliament Funkadelic's Mothership Connection. Right, yeah. Classic. And I loved that record. Mm-hmm. And it was so entertaining. Yeah. It was funny. Mm-hmm. It was interesting. Yeah. It was so unique. You know, like, and then at NYU, I I was a director of an acapella group. And so I wanted to do funk music. Yeah. And so I did this like mega funk mix. Wow. It was like a a mashup. Yeah. And we did, um, we did uh, Tear the Roof Off the Sucker. Yeah. We did um, Night of the Thumposaurus Peoples. <laughs> we did a bunch of, you know, really cool, like, you know, just this cool funk mix. And yeah. um, that was something that I dove into. Mm. And I was like, I know that this is funk music. Like, what else is out there? Mm. And it's like, I found Ohio Players. Ohio Players, yeah. And I found um, all these guys, you know, like, um, you know, Bootsy Collins Mm -hmm. and, you know, obviously a lot of funk, uh, James Brown Mm -hmm. and um, all these amazing funk musicians Mm -hmm. and 
then I, I got into that, um, in Colorado. Yeah. I was in a cover band that Colorado was. Colorado have a funk scene? I mean, that's where Earth, Wind and Fire is from. No way. I didn't yeah. know. Yeah. The, the leader of Earth, Wind and Fire is from Denver. Mm. Yeah. I can't remember his name right now, but yeah. Oh. Yeah. It's a very diverse music scene there. Mm. And, um, so I, I was in a cover band that was funk based and then I was in an original band that was funk based and that was a band called Bop Schism. Mm. And we got to do a lot of great gigs, um, including Red Rocks Amphitheater, which is still to this day, my favorite gig I've ever played. Yeah, that's beautiful. Beautiful venue. Amazing. Yeah. So awesome. Mm. And, um, this DJ in town, really liked our band and he he came up to me and he's like you remind me of this woman named ruth copeland Mm. and she was one of the producers of parliament's first record at like 20 years old nuts because she had a a record industry boyfriend okay so she really got in Mm -hmm. to those inner circles and she was uh she also had a relationship with sly stone Mm. and so i i kind of like latched on to this woman um, who's from the UK, white lady in the funk world. Yeah. And he's like, you remind me of this lady. Wow. So I, I'm kind of like after my book and after some stuff. And if I get like a million dollars, I'm going to make a musical about her life. And, mm. and uh, well, we'll just say it's a fictionalized yeah. version maybe about someone like her yeah. <laughs> Copyright i'm not purposes. gonna be getting those rights yeah. Yeah. <laughs> wow. but um it was just something that it it struck something in me mm-hmm. because it was um it was danceable mm-hmm. it was fun mm-hmm. it was comedic like they're making they're cracking a lot of jokes on those records mm-hmm. and it just makes you feel good. And it, um, it's, it's very freeing. Mm-hmm. It's like a free genre yeah. and it's like, there are no rules and it kind of like, it makes you blast off into space. Mm-hmm. And, um, it's just something that was really resonating mm-hmm. with me. And mm-hmm. I got really into that music and it, it really just cool. like, it, mm-hmm it's a music of freedom mm-hmm. and it's a music of, um, togetherness, mm-hmm. like, uh, you know, Booker T and the MGs, they were one of the first integrated bands, mm-hmm. Sly Stone, one mm-hmm. of the first integrated bands. Yeah. And they, they got a lot of heat from both sides mm-hmm. of those different audiences. Yeah. Tried to shut them down. Yeah. yeah. And that's why I love that music. Cause it was like, we're brothers. Mm. We make music together. Mm. And this stuff on the outside, like this doesn't matter. Yeah. Matters what is inside your soul. Mm. And so that is really inspiring to me. Um, that genre and it and also like disco and soul mm. and all that. But that's cool. Yeah. When I was a when I was five years old, I'll just tell this quick story. Mm. Um we went to go see the, sh- the musical Showboat. Mm. And my mom was like, what character would you be if you were in this show? And I was like, I want to be the guy that sings Old Man River. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like. That's a it, random choice. <laughs> I know. It's like <laughs> when it comes to music, like I've always felt this sense of like resonance with the old spirituals Mm -hmm. and the blues and jazz and gospel and soul and everything and i don't know just Mm -hmm. it got into my soul and it was like it was just rattling it and ringing it yeah and and like i said my mom was playing all that soul music Mm -hmm. and it's just it's like i I, it's like yes this is this is my music this is my favorite kind of music so yeah, now it, it happens. That happened to Ray Charles. It happened to, you know, he got into gospel music and actually created some of his biggest hits from renditions of those mm-hmm. gospel songs that he heard, which caused a controversy with the church. Well, yeah. It's neither here nor there. <laughs> uh, and then Elvis Presley um, was oh, very yeah. much inspired by 
old blues singers and gospel music. Mm-hmm. Uh, what he clearly made remade gospel songs and yeah. So yeah, it, it really does have that influence. At one point, the church, uh, I think the church really did used to be the head. Maybe, but you could also argue they didn't know it. Mm-hmm. You could argue they didn't realize it. They were just worshiping their creator. They were worshiping God. And the power of that worship went out around the world yeah. and inspired people to write songs out of those same melodies and similar rhythms. Just kind mm-hmm. of put something more jungle to it or something jazzy. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah. Or just change the words. And just change the words. That's mm-hmm. some people, the issue they had with Ray, they felt like he just changed the words and put like a more, at the time, what they call kind of club worldly beat yeah, to it. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. It was like, instead yeah. of worshiping God, now we're trying to pick up chicks. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, and the songs are about that. And so, uh, yeah, it's really interesting. I, I really do feel like at one point the church was an influence um, but then oh, yeah. we became Definitely. searching more to be like others and mm-hmm. in the world and to try to pull people in. And I get it. A lot of it's, the, you know, the Bible says go out to the highways and byways and compel them to come in. Yeah. And what are they compelled in, you know, by? It's his mm-hmm. love. Mm-hmm. And it's his love through the music. So yep. sometimes we do things like, oh, let me put up these cool lights and lasers or let me do this <laughs> and <laughs> and this will bring the young people in, uh, you know, this will draw them in. And sometimes it does, you know, mm-hmm. but sometimes it also, the cost is, do we look too much like this or that? Yep. Um, and so, yeah, speaking of uh, the Grammys was this past weekend. Mm-hmm. Did mm-hmm. you watch it? Did you, did you, you know, see well, some of the debacle, the craziness? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I always assume that it's going to be crazy yeah. and that they're going to have something on there that is straight wicked. Mm-hmm. And it has been a while since I watched any award show mm-hmm. and I did not watch. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I am on Instagram, so I saw all the news Same, the news yeah. cycle. Just the clips. Yeah, yeah. Yep. I saw some clips and I, like I said earlier, it's like if my kind of music is music that can actually go past the heavenly barrier mm-hmm. okay, or that can come to earth from heaven. Mm-hmm. It's like, if it's not that good, I didn't do what I'm supposed to do. And so I, I really don't watch those kind of things mm-hmm. because it always feel like it makes you feel empty inside. Mm-hmm. I mean, it does me anyway. Yeah. And it's a big idol fest. Mm-hmm. And from what I heard, it was even kind of dialed up this year because they, they did this thing with the super fans mm-hmm. and they had the super fans like presenting the awards. Yeah. And some of these people, like they really, they change themselves to be like their idols. Yeah. Yeah. And it's like, it's just sad. It's sad yeah. to me. Like, yeah. I would rather be out playing some Frisbee in the sunshine mm-hmm. and to, than to see all these people who who want to talk about moral superiority mm-hmm. in their own twisted moral, I would say, delusion. Mm-hmm. And yet they're wearing, you know, $20,000 in clothes. Mm-hmm. And they're they're doing things that just degrade them. Like they're mm-hmm. they're worth more than that. Yeah. And so I would want to see those people um, put down the lesser thing and mm-hmm. take up a truer, better thing. Mm-hmm. And um, I do not envy them. Mm-hmm. I don't envy them because it's like those things are on video. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Those things are on video. Yeah. And and they went, they made imprints on people's minds mm-hmm. and souls. Like I have things in my past that um, I wish I could do it again. Mm-hmm. And I hope that God gives me the chance to do it again because I, I didn't carry myself in a royal fashion. Yeah. 
that I should have carried myself as. Mm -hmm. So it's like, you know, wearing nice clothes is not evil. Mm -hmm. But if you're, if you're uh, glorifying the destroyer, Mm -hmm. you're, you're a slave. What about looking at it through a different lens? Like, Mm -hmm. can we, what, what if we can have an impact on that culture? What if you, yeah have the opportunity to stand on the Grammy stage and glorify God and actually be a light. Yeah. Show them something different from what they're seeing throughout the whole Mm -hmm. night. Well, I would say, you know, it might be hard to get there Mm -hmm. if you're doing, if you're doing the, the real authentic glory to God thing. Mm -hmm. Um, Lauren Daigle did a couple years ago. She got some awards. Mm Mm-hmm. So that's what I'm saying is when there's... Well, I mean, also it's like, I think what matters more is what is the character of that person when the cameras are off? Okay, yeah. You know, because if someone says that they worship God and Mm -hmm. then they're rude to their staff Mm -hmm. or they are, they've got character problems, Mm -hmm. that that's the first issue, Mm -hmm. you know, because what you do in secret is more important than what you do in public. Of course, yeah. And yeah. so, like, the soul is more important than mm-hmm. the facade of what everyone's seeing on mm-hmm. television. That's, like, the product of teams of people and millions of dollars mm-hmm. of marketing and and production value mm-hmm. from a lot of labels that don't give to cares about the gospel. They, they like the money that Christians want to spend, but do they actually have godly business practices? Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. Well, the reason why I brought it up is because there, there was a cool part of the night where, um, Maverick city actually made some good history there where they, you know, got four Grammys. So cool. they had a whole list of the the largest nominees. Beyonce was number one. Number mm-hmm. two was Maverick City. And so that's why I was asking some of those questions because it was pure gospel songs, worship songs. Nice. That that's awesome. A lot of churches are singing right now. And, yeah. And that's what they want on. That's good. It was good. pure gospel. So the, and, and I also interviewed somebody from Maverick City here uh, not too long ago. And it was it was amazing. And some of the stuff we talked about is how the, the influence of their worship is actually going mm-hmm. beyond. We couldn't talk about certain names on the podcast, yeah, of course, that yeah. they're now being able to minister to and have relationships with. But it's going beyond the church. And so that's what I'm saying. Mm-hmm. What if there's an opportunity that yes. actually you're actually reaching people that yes. never, ever set foot in the church yep. just because of her? Because reality is. We can say, oh, you need to be in church, but then we've also hurt and rejected people Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, like the Beatles and Dr. Dre and just like all these stories where they did turn to the church and then they got turned away. Oh, wow. Or they're told, get that devil music out of here, which Mm. I've heard from several producers like Dr. Dre, who I Mm. realized started off in the church, but he knows hymns and gospel. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, yeah, there's there's these elements of like where people... um, you know, they would not step into church, but then what if the church comes to them and says, I'm going to meet you where you're at. Yeah. You nice. know, I'm going to show you what, mm-hmm. you know, you know, the mercy of God looks like. Yeah. I'm going to show you. And so I just, I don't know. I thought that was pretty cool. Was that Maverick City got a chance to share that stage? Um, there's some, there's a lot of Christians actually pushing back on it, though, because of the some people call the satanic fest that was happening before and after. Mm -hmm. And so people are like, Oh, you shouldn't like be receiving those kind of rewards should not matter and all that kind of stuff. And so I was going to ask you, what do you think about that? Um, That's kind of the the topic. A lot of the church is talking about now is like, Oh, you, it shouldn't matter to receive a reward from the Grammys because that's like satanic, that's devil stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Um, but at the same time, you can't help it. If your music just does really well yeah. and they call you to it, that's also a high achievement. Just like yeah. uh, my buddy who's a writer from Africa City made a point. It's like when you're a valid Victorian in college, do we celebrate that? These are worldly institutions. Yep. Um, if you end up that's true. making 
I don't know, police chief or something. And then there's a ceremony for you. Should we be celebrating that too? Yeah. That's also a worldly institution. Yeah. And so he's saying that when God blesses you, elevates you, you shouldn't accept it because it comes from somebody from the world or anything like uh-huh. that. And I thought that was a pretty valid point. It's like, yeah, we're 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 kind of coming down pretty hard on other Christians for achieving something great. But then when we do it in our own way, mm-hmm. our own, you know, uh, fields, various fields of mm-hmm. influence, then it's okay. Yeah. Because it's on a smaller stage rather than a larger stage. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Well, I mean, there is that verse where um, Paul is talking about there's all these different preachers preaching. Mm-hmm. Some are doing it for their own gain. Mm-hmm. But regardless, Christ is preached. Yeah. And for that, I give thanks. Mm-hmm. So if if people are praising God on a huge stage, national TV, yeah. bring it on. Like, go for it. Yeah, yeah. Go big. Magnify. It's the Magnify the thing, name. The only thing you'll see that whole entire night that's anything remotely God. Because yeah. everything else was anti-Christ or anti yeah. yeah. And then there's also more that he says is like, you know, be be like someone in order to win them, mm. which is true as well. Like he he didn't only read the Bible; mm-hmm. he read every philosopher mm. and sage and poet. When in Rome, yeah, and it's like the Romans do. He he read, um, and even one of those poetry, like even some of that poetry, made it into the scripture where he's like, "I see that you're very religious." And you have a, a, a shrine to an unknown God. Mm. And he's like, I know that God. Mm. Or he's like, as your own poets have said, we are in him and we are his children. Mm. So he he was taking the poetry of the world, of the mm. secular world. Right. And he was saying, that's God mm. that you're seeking after. Mm. And so, um, that's cool. you know, like there is a huge opportunity Mm -hmm. to to win people Mm -hmm. on those stages and and i've mostly been a person who wants to it's like you know when they they have the parable of the leaven Mm -hmm. she's like she took a little leaven and she hid it Mm -hmm. in the dough yeah and then she worked it Mm -hmm. into the dough until the whole thing was leavened yeah wow and it's like, I love hiding the kingdom in the art. Me too. I mm-hmm. love that too. That, that's actually the kind of songwriter and producer I am. Yes. Like, you it's know, hidden in there. There's just going but to be. But it's this, all in there. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's <laughs> all in there. Yeah, I love that. It's like adding those biblical truths and things at the core of your foundation and whatever you do. Mm-hmm. Uh, may it be unto God. You know, I, yeah. I look at it as worship, not as like. These songs that we sing on a Sunday morning, mm-hmm. lifting our hands. And that is also a form of worship, but I, I believe that's more corporate worship is it's called. Mm-hmm. And I think worship, I believe worship should just be everything you do unto the Lord. Yep. So even, you know, I always like to quote Brother Lawrence. <laughs> he, you know, his life was everything unto God. So when he was in a French military, he would cook his food. He would cook all the food for the soldiers unto God. Yep. And he would do it in such a powerful way that the presence of God began to permeate the kitchen. Yes. Totally. And all these military folks would come by the window and they would watch him cook. I mean, who, who just <laughs> watches some old guy just cook in the kitchen? But it's because he was praying and, and all the, you know, whatever the stir the chili, yes. whatever it was, unto God. Yep. And so the presence started sweeping totally. through the building and people would watch him. Uh, sometimes he would wash dishes and the power of God, he would just pray unto God. The power mm-hmm. of God would just mm-hmm. fill that place. And so That's he awesome. took that wherever he went in life and he just made sure it was unto the Lord. Yep. And so mm-hmm. that's how I look at it. That's worship is when we do everything unto God, whether you're gardening or you're yep. leading a team somewhere. Amen. Uh, whether you're on the police force, you're out on the streets, mm-hmm. like, you know, you're doing it unto the Lord. That's worship. Amen. Yeah. It's uh, good. By the way, what does worship look like to you in your everyday life and in your sphere of influence? Mm-hmm. What does worship look like to you? 
Well, I feel like it's really um, the things that you do in secret Mm -hmm. and the little sacrifices that you make or the big sacrifices that you make and the things that you do and you literally keep it a secret Mm -hmm. because it's only done for him Mm -hmm. and you never tell anyone. And I love, um, and then also this, this concept of when you give, don't let your left hand know what your right is doing. Yes. Right. Yeah. So it's like, don't keep track of your generosity. Mm -hmm. Do not keep track of your, of your giving. Um, something that's been really, um, at the forefront of my heart is, is forgiveness. Mm. So it's like when I can forgive someone, that is worship as well. Yeah. Because that's that's doing what he says. Mm-hmm. It's like believe in him and do what he says. Mm-hmm. And he's like, forgive. Because you're just the same. Mm. And so when people disappoint you or when you have, you know, when you're in traffic and it's like you want to be angry or if you have like pain from your past or anything, anything that's coming up in your mind Mm -hmm. to intentionally forgive Mm. that person that that's like magnifying Christ. That's, that's like worshiping God to forgive that person. Mm. Um, so like literally saying, I forgive blank person. Yeah. 20 times, 30 times, 40 times, 50 times, like this real consistent practice of forgiveness Mm. because, um, if you hold forget, if you hold bitterness and unforgiveness, that is access point. Mm. And I don't know about you or about y'all, but, (laughs) um, I can get offended easily. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And maybe you won't notice it, mm-hmm. but it's going on in here. It's yeah. going on, on in my heart. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I, I can be honest about that. And yeah. it's like any little thing mm-hmm. can be an access point yeah. to keep you from your destiny, Yeah, to keep you from the grace mm-hmm. that God wants to give you. Mm-hmm. And so forgiveness, um, I recently... I'll just say this because this is like, you know, Christian people listening, but I recently got into the concept of an altar. So setting up a room in your house or setting up a tent or setting up a place that's a dedicated space. And it's like, this is the holy place. And it's like, when I step in there, I feel like I'm stepping on heaven ground, like heaven's Mm. ground. And it's like, wow. Wow. Like yeah. I'm stepping on the heavenly ground yeah. right now. Yeah. And cause it is a place where mm-hmm. an altar is a place where the spiritual realm meets the physical realm. Right. right. Yeah. Which is why I don't watch the Grammys yeah. because that is an altar. Mm. That is an, another altar. Yeah. But when those people go and they bring glory to the name of Jesus, mm. then it becomes a different kind of altar. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. So, it's like I've set up this space and it's a secret. Yeah. I mean, like, you know, my my housemates don't know about it. Mm-hmm. And it's like you just go in there first thing in the morning, yeah. first thing when you come back home. Yeah. And you just stop and you praise and you worship and you you listen mm-hmm. and you, you know, sometimes I do put little flowers in there mm-hmm. or you know, my first Bible from when I was a baby or like some candles or like a painting. Mm. And, um, that's something that I just started doing in the last year. I think it's a powerful thing because the ultimate altar is the cross Mm. where a sacrifice is made. Right. And so you, you put that as like a place where you, you go to lay down, your burdens, you go to sacrifice the praise. Mm-hmm. Like your, your praise is a sacrifice, yeah. especially when you don't feel like doing it, mm-hmm. when you're sad, when you're upset, when you've had like, you know, hope deferred or you feel disappointed, mm-hmm. 
you you praise yeah anyway right because that makes it a sacrifice of praise it's a breakthrough yeah it's a weapon yeah yeah exactly our praise is our weapon and our breakthrough yeah mm -hmm. it's crazy. so just taking it seriously mm. like taking the bible seriously and hopefully not becoming some kind of like self-righteous um, blind Pharisee in mm -hmm. the process, mm -hmm. like to not be overly righteous, just yeah. like Ecclesiastes says. And I, 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 I'm not overly righteous yet. I'll just say that. <laughs> I have some issues still, but um, <laughs> like it's a refining process. That's mm -hmm. why I love the towers of silver concept because yeah. it's like you have to go through a refining yeah. and it's unpleasant and it's, it's very unpleasant. fire is involved. Yeah. And burning is involved. A lot, a lot of fire. <laughs> I, I recently put that on my Instagram and um, yeah, I, I shared a, a message of the season that, you know, me and my wife have been in. It feels like very hard, very tough. And I like to call it the refiner's process. And it's like where God is breaking down gold and mm. he turns up the heat enough to boil out all the impurities of gold, any mm -hmm. things that don't belong there. Yeah, That heat has to burn that out until there's nothing left but pure, solid gold, yeah. you know. And so I was sharing a word on my Instagram saying, like, you know, some people who may feel like, you know, did I upset God? Did I do something wrong or what happened? Like, did I take myself out of his will? It's like, no, it's just, it's actually out of love where he's refining you. He's preparing you mm -hmm. for that next season that you're about to enter. And for some seasons when he's taking you out of one to the next, there's things that you don't need to carry with you, like baggage mm -hmm. and, you know, shackles and all these things Amen. that have held you down in the previous season, you can't take that with you into the promised land. Mm -hmm. And so he has to prepare us uh, and refine us out of love so that when he does pour out the blessing that you can hardly receive, mm -hmm. you really are not going to squander that. You're going to be a good steward of that. You're mm -hmm. going to know what to do. You're going to move in wisdom. Yep. And, and so, you know how to sacrifice. You know how to Instead sacrifice. Instead of gratifying your yeah. every instant desire yeah yeah so yeah I, I really do think there's a process and yeah it's not easy it's hard because each and every day you have to wake up and really press into the lord and um and become a different person yeah yeah uh, like oh yeah i have to change <laughs> i have to do this differently yeah um i saw john comer sunday and he talked about the levels of faith and you know there's there's I forget the first level of faith because the, the, the last two really kind of got me. But the first level is kind of a surface religious faith, I believe. Mm -hmm. uh, it's out of culture and routine. Yeah. Uh, Just my parents and grandparents mm -hmm. took me here. Mm -hmm. This is where we go. Yeah. Very surface. And the second level of faith is um, desperation. Where it's like, God, you have to do this. You know, mm -hmm. and it's like. I believe you because there's just simply no other way, no other choice yeah. is going to happen, uh, which is still great. You know, it's like, you know, you're still putting your faith in them, but it's more out of a desperation. Mm -hmm. And then the third level of faith is that one hurts a lot more because it's choosing to die to something. It's yeah. choosing to change and it's called leveling up. Yeah. We're like, the mm -hmm. previous level of faith you had is not enough. And now it's time to, you can choose to be a better person and grow. Yep. And, or you can stay where you have been, mm -hmm. you know, which is not going to serve you well for the next place he's trying to bring you. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I, I really feel like there's that leveling up process. Yeah. And I, I feel like I'm sort of entering that threshold where it's really hard, but you every day have to make that choice to mm -hmm. really like, trust him yeah you know yeah i've been um listening to a few different people about like goshen mm -hmm. and ruth and mm -hmm. how ruth was in her comfort zone ruth uh, like in the bible in the bible yeah 
Yeah. So it's like she was in Moab. Yeah. She already had other family that she could go back to. Mm -hmm. And Naomi was like, go back to your family and your gods Mm. because I got nothing. Wow. And I'm just going to go to Israel because I think some, you know, God is doing something there. Mm -hmm. And she had to leave Orpah behind. Mm. And she had to go follow this lady who had nothing, but she had the spirit of the living God. Yeah. And she recognized that. And so she went from a place of comfort to a place of being destitute Mm. and having nothing but a poor woman to hold on to. And she had to go be um, an immigrant, Mm. someone who was probably despised because of her ethnicity. Wow. But it led to her breakthrough Mm. because she recognized this woman carries the truth. And it's like, that was more valuable than my comfort zone here mm. in Moab. Wow. And like, it, it does look scary mm. to make that kind of choice. Mm-hmm. And you're like, I don't know what's going to happen. Right. I've never been here. Yeah. You know, people are going to hate me here because <laughs> yeah. I'm a foreigner. <laughs> yeah. But this woman knows God. Mm. I need that. Mm. And no matter what happens, that's the number one thing. Yeah. And so if I have number one, I'm going to be okay. Wow. And she she put the most important thing in its proper place. Mm. And not many people have the courage or the, the insight to do that. Mm. People put money first. Yeah. People put, um, you know, yeah, yeah, it's like in, in heaven, the streets are paved with gold. Mm. That's the pavement right. of heaven is the thing that this world says is number one. And it's like, no, that's cement. That's the heavenly cement. They right. just really think it's very worth, worth a lot here. Mm. <laughs> right. Yeah. It's crazy. <laughs> and people will kill a human for money, mm. this is a really bad idea. Right. Yeah. A human is so much more valuable. Right. And yeah. yet people will kill someone for sneakers. Yeah. yeah you know, like true. they'll kill someone to to steal their insurance money mm. or their their business or something like that. Mm. And this is like this is like the ground mm. in heaven. Yeah, it's crazy. I, it makes you think, you know, it, people have their value systems backwards or focused on the wrong thing. Mm-hmm. You know, they feel like money is going to solve the issues, even a smaller amount. So they will rob, and cheat, and steal, and kill. Yeah. To get three hundred thousand or whatever it is, sixty thousand, and, and I've had that too. I've had inheritance inheritances stolen from me, and so it was more about the money Whoa. than maintaining a relationship with me. And so I've had that happen Seriously. twice actually. And so, wow. yeah, it's, I, I think it just comes from a place where, you know, you have to switch your value system mm-hmm. you know? and uh, when you change your mindset, you change your value system to heaven's economy, heaven's value system. Yep. A lot of that goes away. You know, you don't, you no longer see money the same way. Yeah. You're not bound to it. Mm-hmm. Even uh, there's this book called Happy Money, and it teaches you mm. to look at money differently as energy. Yeah, and what you do with that energy is yes, it's it's important. If you give that energy out with a negative connotation attached to it, mm-hmm. like oh man, I want to pay this bill, but you know, yep. then it comes back to you in a negative way. Mm-hmm. But if you put it out cheerfully, joyfully. And like, I'm yep. happy to give this. Thank you. Lord. Yeah. You know, then it comes back to you in a cheerful way. And That's good. When you don't look at it as something that you have to have, like, I actually don't need this right now. But, uh-huh. you know, like it sometimes we had a guest, a pastor on here recently. He said that him and his wife even started doing this. And he was like, I'm going to need that happy money because that sounds like what we're doing. <laughs> but he said that they started looking at money as something they didn't need. And they put mm-hmm. their trust and belief in God for all that. And when they did that, it's almost like 
money is like, hey, I'm here. Like, yeah. it comes to you and attaches itself it's to true. you. And it's, it's, true. it's a manifestation of just how you live and you, where your value system is. It's in yep. heaven. You know, mm-hmm. so. Yep. If you, the more you try and give it away, the more it's going to stick to you. Yeah. Yeah. I, I really felt mm-hmm. like that. Some people I, I've, I've seen that happen with was like uh, the Bakers, Heidi and Roland Baker, mm. where they constantly always gave a lot. And so then God always blessed them with more in return. Mm-hmm. And so I always mm-hmm. watched their life from, from a distance. And I used to, you know, be closer with her kids and her family. We all would mm-hmm. party and hang out at the house that she bought in Reading. Yeah. And, uh, you would just see the blessings on that family mm-hmm. just flowing in and out yeah. constantly. But it was that always giving. They were mm-hmm. always putting out. So then God was always blessing them with the more. They yeah. weren't seeking out Because the more. they value like humans. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. They value much. people. Yeah. They're like, this is God's image. Yeah. yeah. In front of me right now. <laughs> yeah. Like, wow. Yeah, yeah. And some like poor person that you would want to step around mm-hmm. on the street is like, wow. Yeah. This this is Jesus inside of this person. Right. Yeah. And so money is like very common thing mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. when it comes to that versus like a human person mm-hmm. that you know, especially someone who has Jesus inside of them. Mm. Is that something that you guys uh, just briefly, uh, before we go, just touch on that. Uh, I, I didn't want to forget about the heaven permaculture. Is that something that you do in, in the ministry of heaven, like permaculture? Well, I mean, for heaven permaculture, it's really about creating things that are going to heal souls. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. No matter what kind of a soul it is. Yeah. So it's like, you know, David played the harp. Mm. And it calmed the soul of his enemy. Yeah, yeah. And it made those spirits die down. Yeah. It's like, I want to make every kind of thing that will heal souls because Mm. then the whole world gets better. Mm. Because people people are in misery and, and... and the enemy has a foothold in this world because of wounded souls. Mm. And so if I can make music and films and books and um, gardens and beautiful architecture and whatever God allows me the grace to do, Mm -hmm. um, if it can heal a soul, Mm -hmm. then it might be good enough to be in heaven yeah. someday. Yeah. And it's like, if I can make things that last into eternity, mm. that is what heaven permaculture is about. Or if I can bring heaven to earth mm. to heal people, yeah. then that that is when it's being successful. And it's a very new thing. So, um. It's, it's also about diversity. So it's yeah. like, I want to plant house churches mm-hmm. and I want to mentor young aspiring performing artists and I want to make records and mm-hmm. films and I want to do, you know, digital art and be involved in crypto and mm-hmm. gaming and mm-hmm. like everything that people watch mm-hmm. to try and fill their souls yeah. with something I want to give heaven through those mediums Mm -hmm. so that they'll reach for the thing that is really going to heal their soul. Mm. And so that they'll be healed without even realizing it. Yeah. Like Saul, you know, it's like Mm -hmm. he knew that he was tormented Mm -hmm. and he knew that when he listens to that music, he feels peace. Yeah. And it's like, I want to make, things that give people peace and Mm -hmm. shalom and wholeness. Mm -hmm. And, um, I am figuring out how to do that. And Mm -hmm. hopefully God will, God will be the orchestrator of that and he'll be the builder of it. And he's given me a lot of, um, ideas and things to do. Like he told me to sell my clothes. Mm -hmm. So when I do that unto him, and I'm going to be praying over those clothes. Yeah. 
And it's something that I like to do. I love fashion. I love mm-hmm. to go thrift shopping and, you know, I have too many clothes right now. <laughs> yeah. So I need to get rid of a lot a of them. Downside. <laughs> and so, you know, that is, that is part of heaven permaculture, mm-hmm. selling clothes Wow. that you're doing it for him. And mm-hmm. like, so I'm going to pray over those clothes. Yeah. They're going to have an anointing mm-hmm. when they go to people. Yeah. And it's like anything that you do can be worship. Yeah. Anything that you do can be heaven permaculture. Wow. So it's like I want to do all of all of those things. Yeah. It's just a matter of the strategy of like, you know, doing a little something every day, mm-hmm. knowing when is the right time for what project. Yeah. yeah. So, Yeah. That's so cool. Uh, well, yes, sir. What other projects before you go? What are you most excited about? Things that are coming up on your radar? Uh, what are you most passionate mm-hmm. excited about? Well, I I was able to contribute to a book that's just about to come out mm-hmm. called Pop Culture Purge. Oh wow! And my chapter is from me, me, me to Christ in me, mm. and. It has this analogy of like soil and growing. And Mm. so, you know, in line with my whole heaven permaculture thing. And um, it's just about to be published. Mm. And I'm about to go on a speaking tour for that. Wow. Um, That's a woman named Tina Griffin. She has a really amazing guests. She has a show called Counterculture Mom. Mm. And she has the craziest people on there. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> like people who have gone through terrible things mm. and she really exposes a lot of messed up things going on in Hollywood and, mm-hmm. and the world. I, I like to be, I'm the more like positive mm-hmm. version of that. Like, yeah. so, um, you know, it's basically talking about getting rid of pride mm-hmm. and so that's my piece of her book and okay. hopefully that'll be coming out soon. Mm-hmm. But um, if people want to connect with me, they can follow me on Instagram and yeah. just text me through there. And how do they? Where where can they follow you at on Instagram? Yeah, Instagram is just my name, Erin mm-hmm. Joe Harris. Mm-hmm. It's E R I N J O H A R R I S, and you can DM me and you know mention Towers of Silver or mention House Church or mention mentorship mm-hmm. and. Um, you know, it's a diverse um, portfolio of things that I'm involved in. So health and fitness or yeah. anything. Um, yeah. But really the next big thing is Towers of Silver. So that should be coming out this year. That's exciting. Yeah, that sounds amazing. I love that. Yeah, because we, we live in a culture where being a woman is very, and I'll be careful what I say. <laughs> I know some of this is going on YouTube, <laughs> but being a woman is very controversial right now. Yeah. And I feel I've heard a lot of women say that and <laughs> struggle because <laughs> <laughs> now uh, being a woman it looks like almost anything, you know, it's like, so Ooh-wee. yeah, it's really cool to have something that kind of anchors you back to yeah. like, what it really is. You yes. Know? This is a sacred guide to womanhood. Yeah. Yeah. And it is sacred to yeah. be a man, to be a woman is yeah. sacred. Yeah. And God made you. Mm-hmm. God made you. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. He didn't make a mistake. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, it's like we need this kind mm-hmm. of a thing. Yeah. And how beautiful to be a woman with standards yeah. and boundaries. Mm-hmm. What God says that he'll do is he'll surround you with people that are going to build a tower of silver on you. Mm-hmm. A battlement of silver. Mm. It's like you are a castle. Mm. You are a place where an army can come yeah. and be safe wow. inside of your walls. Mm. And um, yeah, I'm just getting emotional because people are so precious. Mm-hmm. And I, I really... It breaks my heart to see people succumbing to lies that yeah. are pervasive in the culture. Yeah. And it's not kind to let someone be trapped in a lie. Yeah. 
it's actually very cruel. Yeah. And so I'll never, I'll never say it's okay for you to live a lie. Mm -hmm. I'll never say that yeah. because that would make me a partner to one who destroys. Right. Yeah. And um, I want to cultivate. Yeah. Wow. That's yeah. so good. That's so great. Yeah. I, I really love and uh, honor your conviction. Like it's, it's so powerful. Yeah. Thank you, my friend. Yeah. It's been many years. God has taken <laughs> yeah. us so far. Yeah. Like what is going to be next? That's, I know. <laughs> you know, we, we met each other nine years ago. Like yeah. what is going to happen nine years from now? Yeah. Wow. That's this is so going to be like the next <laughs> Disney and we're going to be like, oh, what million, you know, multi-million dollar film series are we going to produce next? <laughs> That's so awesome. <laughs> right? Yes and amen. Right? So yeah. that's what I hope for for you guys and yeah. and for God's people. It's yeah. going to be an awesome next decade. Come on. That's so good. <laughs> well, thank you so much for coming on to the show. Thank you for no, having sorry me. Sorry we kept you a little longer than, than normal. Time flies I know, when you're having fun. I know you got to go back to Nashville today, so I don't want to yeah. keep you any longer. But yeah, thank I, you, sir. I wanted to thank you for taking the time to come on to this platform and sharing your story, your testimony, your ministry, your passion. And yeah. Just showing us what it's like to truly love the Lord and walk with him day by day. So. Yes. Thank you for that. You're and welcome. We'll make sure we link all your stuff down below where people can follow Perfect. you. So just and check for the down. people watching the videos, yeah. I brought a little something. Oh. A little silver, a little gold. Look at that. This this is just pavement yeah. in heaven. These are just bricks. Wow. For your tower. Yeah. So um and also you should pick some up. Yeah. <laughs> Pick some up, y'all. Pick up Pick some, some precious metals. Yes, precious metals is a lot better than that US <laughs> yeah. dollar right now. <laughs> and it, it just dipped. Yeah. So it's a good time to buy. Yeah. Just dipped a little bit. So pick yeah. some up. Move that move the savings over to gold. <laughs> <laughs> Do it. These are really cool. They're called gold backs. Okay. And so like four states are printing these little bills of gold. This wow. is one. 200th of an ounce of gold Wow! in a little bill form. And this is just an ounce, one ounce bar. Wow! You know, like people ask, do you want a, a candy bar or a bar of silver? Like yeah. a 10 ounce bar of silver, they take the candy bar. So don't be one of those people. <laughs> I see that on Mike Dice's uh, his YouTube <laughs> don't channel. Don't be one of them. He went to like Santa Monica Pier and he was offering the candy and uh, or the silver. And yeah. Choose, the choose the silver, guys. Come on yeah. now. Take it from me, your good friend Aaron Joe. Yeah. <laughs> but so thank great. you for having me. Yeah, thank you for coming. It was a pleasure. On. Yeah, but have a great and safe trip. Yeah. Thank I'll see you. you. Yeah, hopefully come back when you come back to LA or Orange County. Sounds good. Show, so. Peace out, y'all. Blessing. Much love. Yeah.